Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Your teaching has revolutionized my life. It set me on course for, for where I'm going for the rest of my life. So thank you, Andrew, for all you've done for me. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. I'm near the end of my second week teaching on a subject that I've entitled The True Nature of God. I tell you, this is one of the first revelations that God gave me that just began to just radically change the way I related to God. I had been brought up under a legalistic mindset that God demanded perfection And if I prayed for something and didn't see the answer, it was because I wasn't good enough, I wasn't holy enough. And so I was on this treadmill just trying to be perfect so that I could earn God's favor. And regardless of how hard I tried, there was always something I was falling short in, and it was just disappointing. I believe that if the Lord hadn't given me the revelation that I'm sharing in this teaching, I probably would have despaired of just ever GETTING THINGS RIGHT, AND I MIGHT HAVE GONE THE OTHER DIRECTION, NOT BECAUSE I DIDN'T BELIEVE IN GOD, BUT BECAUSE I JUST FELT LIKE, HOW COULD I EVER APPEASE THIS ANGRY GOD, THIS DEMANDING GOD? AND IT WOULD HAVE RUINED MY RELATIONSHIP WITH HIM. BUT THE THINGS THAT THE LORD HAS SHOWN ME, THE THINGS THAT I'M TEACHING HERE ON TELEVISION, HAS JUST TRANSFORMED MY LIFE TO UNDERSTAND THAT GOD IS A GOOD GOD, THAT GOD IS LOVE, THAT GOD IS FULL OF GRACE, AND WHEN I SAW THAT, YOU KNOW, I ACTUALLY EXPERIENCED THIS GRACE BEFORE I UNDERSTOOD IT. I'VE MENTIONED THIS IN THE PAST, BUT ON MARCH THE 23rd, 1968, I GOT BORN AGAIN IN 58, AND I WAS TRULY SAVED, BUT I WENT TO CHURCH, I BECAME A RELIGIOUS PHARISEE, AND I BEGAN TO START THINKING THAT I HAD TO DO EVERYTHING JUST RIGHT IN ORDER TO GET GOD TO MOVE IN MY LIFE, AND I WAS PROUD OF MY GOODNESS I WAS BETTER THAN ANYBODY ELSE I KNEW. I'M NOT SAYING THAT IN A PRIDEFUL WAY. I'M JUST SAYING THAT I WAS GIVING IT EVERYTHING I HAD. I NEVER MISSED CHURCH. I NEVER WENT WITHOUT READING MY BIBLE EVERY SINGLE DAY, AND I WAS LIVING AS HOLY AS I KNEW HOW. AND THE LORD SHOWED UP IN ONE OF MY PRAYER MEETINGS AND SHOWED ME THAT MY SELF-RIGHTEOUSNESS WAS LIKE FILTHY RAGS AND THAT I WAS TRUSTING IN MYSELF INSTEAD OF TRUSTING IN HIM. AND SO I REPENTED AND WHEN I DID, I THOUGHT MAYBE GOD WAS GOING TO KILL ME, BUT INSTEAD OF KILLING ME, I MEAN THE LOVE OF GOD, THE THING THAT I'D BEEN TRYING TO EARN FOR 10 YEARS OF BEING A CHRISTIAN, THE LOVE OF GOD JUST CAME FLOODING THROUGH ME. SO I EXPERIENCED GOD AND HIS LOVE BY GRACE. BUT EVEN THOUGH I HAD FELT THAT IN MY HEART, MY HEAD WAS EDUCATED WITH THIS PERFORMANCE-BASED MENTALITY. AND SO EVEN THOUGH I HAD EXPERIENCED THE LOVE AND THE GRACE OF GOD COMPLETELY INDEPENDENT OF ANYTHING I DESERVED, I WAS STILL TRYING TO EARN IT BECAUSE THAT'S WHAT I'D BEEN TAUGHT. DID YOU KNOW YOU HAVE TO RENEW YOUR MIND? THE SCRIPTURE SAYS IN PROVERBS 23, 7, AS HE THINKETH IN HIS HEART, SO IS HE. YOUR LIFE IS GOING TO GO THE WAY OF YOUR DOMINANT THOUGHT. AND IF YOU DON'T RENEW YOUR THOUGHTS, AND IF YOU DON'T GET YOUR THOUGHTS LINED UP WITH THE WORD OF GOD, AND IF YOU'RE THINKING WRONG ABOUT THINGS, THEN YOU WILL EVENTUALLY EXPERIENCE THE RESULTS OF THAT WRONG THINKING. LET ME SAY IT THIS WAY, THAT YOU KNOW, GOD IS WHO HE IS, REGARDLESS OF WHAT YOU THINK. BUT AS FAR AS YOUR EXPERIENCE GOES, YOU WILL NEVER EXPERIENCE GOD BEYOND WHAT YOU THINK. IF YOUR DOCTRINE IS WRONG, YOUR EXPERIENCE IS GOING TO BE WRONG. FOR INSTANCE, IF YOU DON'T BELIEVE THAT GOD DOES MIRACLES TODAY, if you, IF YOU ARE PART OF ONE OF THOSE CHURCHES THAT TEACHES THAT ALL OF THE MIRACLES CEASED WITH THE LAST APOSTLE, WHICH IN THE FIRST PLACE IS LUDICROUS BECAUSE THERE'S STILL APOSTLES TODAY. THERE IS NO LAST APOSTLE. BARNABAS WAS CALLED AN APOSTLE IN uh, THE BOOK OF ACTS AND STUFF, AND SO IT WASN'T JUST THE 12 APOSTLES AND STUFF. SO ANYWAY, IF YOU BELIEVE THAT MIRACLES HAVE PASSED AWAY, GUESS WHAT? YOU WON'T RECEIVE A MIRACLE. YOU DON'T HAVE MIRACLES COME UPON YOU AND JUST ATTACK YOU LIKE A SEIZURE. (laughs) YOU DON'T JUST GET MIRACLES. YOU HAVE TO PURSUE THE THINGS OF GOD. YOU HAVE TO BELIEVE IN ORDER TO RECEIVE. AND SO IF YOU WERE TAUGHT THAT THE BAPTISM OF THE HOLY SPIRIT AND THE GIFTS OF THE HOLY SPIRIT AREN'T FOR TODAY, GUESS WHAT? YOU WON'T HAVE THOSE THINGS FUNCTION IN YOU. IF YOU WERE TAUGHT THAT YOU DON'T, PEOPLE DON'T GET HEALED TODAY, 
YOU KNOW, I JUST HAD SOMEBODY IN THE PAPER CRITICIZE ME AND SAY THAT A PERSON THAT WOULD SAY THAT HE SAW A PERSON RAISED FROM THE DEAD, IF HE'LL LIE ABOUT THAT, HE'LL LIE ABOUT ANYTHING BECAUSE <laughs> THEY JUST DON'T BELIEVE THAT MIRACLES HAPPEN TODAY. AND SO THEY CALL ME A LIAR ABOUT EVERYTHING I SAY. IF YOU DON'T BELIEVE THAT, GUESS WHAT? YOU'LL NEVER SEE PEOPLE RAISED FROM THE DEAD. YOU'LL NEVER SEE PEOPLE HEALED. GOD IS WHO HE IS, REGARDLESS OF WHAT YOU THINK. BUT YOUR THINKING WILL EITHER RELEASE THE POWER OF GOD IN YOUR LIFE IF YOU HAVE CORRECT THINKING, OR IT WILL BLOCK THE FLOW OF GOD'S POWER IN YOUR LIFE. AND SO YOU'VE GOT TO GET YOUR MIND RENEWED. SO I HAD EXPERIENCED THE GRACE OF GOD, AND TO A DEGREE, I HAD EMBRACED IT, BUT IF I HADN'T have GOTTEN MY THINKING STRAIGHTENED OUT, I WOULD HAVE EVENTUALLY GONE BACK INTO THAT SAME LEGALISTIC MINDSET, AND I WOULD HAVE LOST THE BENEFIT OF THAT. SO THIS TEACHING RIGHT HERE ON THE TRUE NATURE OF GOD IS ONE OF THE THINGS THAT JUST LITERALLY SET MY LIFE ON A DIFFERENT COURSE BECAUSE I SAW THE WRATH, I SAW THE PERFORMANCE-BASED RELATIONSHIP UNDER THE OLD COVENANT, AND IT LOOKED CONTRARY TO THE GRACE THAT WAS GIVEN OUT IN THE NEW COVENANT. And LIKE ON OUR PROGRAM YESTERDAY, I MENTIONED THE WOMAN TAKEN IN THE ACT OF ADULTERY, AND GOD FORGAVE HER INSTEAD OF ENFORCING THE OLD TESTAMENT LAW. IT LOOKED LIKE A CONTRADICTION. I SAW ELIJAH CALL FIRE DOWN OUT OF HEAVEN AND KILL 102 MEN, 2 KINGS CHAPTER 1, AND IN THE NEW TESTAMENT, HIS DISCIPLES TRIED TO EMULATE ELIJAH, AND JESUS REBUKED HIM AND SAID, NO, THAT'S NOT THE SPIRIT THAT YOU ARE OF. SO WHICH WAS IT? AND IT WAS CONFLICTING TO ME. AND IF I HADN'T have GOTTEN SOME ANSWERS, I BELIEVE THAT I PROBABLY WOULD HAVE LOST THE BENEFIT OF THAT ENCOUNTER I HAD WITH THE LORD. AS A MAN THINKS IN HIS HEART, SO IS HE. SO YOU'VE GOT TO GET YOUR THINKING RENEWED, AND THAT'S WHAT THIS WHOLE SERIES IS ABOUT. SO LET ME GO TO ROMANS CHAPTER 5, AND IN VERSE 8, THIS IS A FAMILIAR PASSAGE OF SCRIPTURE TO PEOPLE THAT HAVE BEEN IN THE CHURCH FOR A WHILE. BUT IT SAYS, BUT GOD COMMENDETH HIS LOVE TOWARD US IN THAT WHILE WE WERE YET SINNERS, CHRIST DIED FOR US. FIRST OF ALL, LET ME SAY THAT THE VERSE BEGINS WITH THE WORD BUT. THAT'S A CONJUNCTION. THAT MEANS IT TIES IT TO WHAT WAS JUST PREVIOUSLY SAID, AND THERE IS NOT uh, AN ENDING TO THAT uh, POINT THAT HE WAS MAKING. THE REAL POINT THAT HE'S TRYING TO MAKE IS IN VERSE 9. IT SAYS, MUCH MORE THAN BEING NOW JUSTIFIED BY HIS BLOOD, WE SHALL BE SAVED FROM WRATH THROUGH HIM. SO WE OFTEN TAKE ROMANS CHAPTER 5, VERSE 8, OUT OF CONTEXT, AND WE JUST SAY THAT GOD COMMENDED HIS LOVE TOWARD US AND THAT WHILE WE WERE YET SINNERS, CHRIST DIED FOR US. AND WE USE THAT TO TELL PEOPLE ABOUT THE LOVE OF GOD FOR SINNERS. AND THAT'S TRUE. BUT THE POINT THAT'S BEING MADE IS THAT IF GOD LOVED US ENOUGH TO DIE FOR US WHILE WE WERE A SINNER, VERSE 9, NOW MUCH MORE THAT WE HAVE BEEN SAVED BY HIS BLOOD, WE SHALL BE SAVED uh, THROUGH HIM. AND SO the, IT'S MAKING A COMPARISON. AND MANY TIMES PEOPLE WILL SIT THERE AND ACCEPT THE LOVE OF GOD FOR A SINNER, BUT MAN, THE MOMENT YOU GET BORN AGAIN, YOU GOT TO START LIVING UNDER A STRICTER RULE THAN WHAT SINNERS DO. I'VE HEARD PEOPLE PHRASE IT THIS WAY, THAT, YOU KNOW, YOU DON'T CORRECT YOUR NEIGHBOR'S CHILDREN, YOU CORRECT YOUR CHILDREN. YOU MIGHT LET YOUR NEIGHBOR'S CHILDREN GET BY WITH THINGS, BUT THE PEOPLE UNDER YOUR AUTHORITY, MAN, YOU ARE, YOU TOLD THE LINE ON THEM. AND WHAT THEY MEAN IS THAT AS LONG AS YOU'RE A SINNER, GOD MAY WINK AT YOUR SIN AND, and OVERLOOK SOME THINGS, BUT THE MOMENT YOU BECOME uh, BORN AGAIN, MAN, YOU'RE GOING TO HAVE TO START PERFORMING OR YOU WON'T GET ANYTHING FROM GOD. YOU KNOW, IF I REALLY BELIEVED THAT, THEN THE MOMENT YOU GOT BORN AGAIN, I'D KILL YOU. I MIGHT GO TO HELL, BUT THAT'D BE THE ONLY WAY YOU'D EVER GET TO HEAVEN <laughs> IF YOU HAD TO LIVE PERFECT AND DO ALL OF THESE KIND OF THINGS. IT SAYS IN COLOSSIANS CHAPTER 2, VERSE 6, AS YOU HAVE THEREFORE RECEIVED CHRIST JESUS THE LORD, SO WALK YE IN HIM. THAT MEANS HOW DID YOU RECEIVE SALVATION? DID YOU RECEIVE IT WHEN YOU HAD BEEN DOING EVERYTHING PERFECTLY, WHEN YOU'D BEEN GOING TO CHURCH AND PAYING YOUR TITHES AND, AND DOING EVERYTHING RIGHT AND READING YOUR BIBLE? WITH THE VAST MAJORITY OF YOU, YOU HADN'T BEEN READING THE BIBLE AT ALL. YOU HADN'T BEEN GOING TO CHURCH. YOU WERE LIVING LIKE A SINNER LIVES. AND YET SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER, GOD REACHED YOU, YOU RECEIVED SALVATION AS A GIFT WHEN YOU HAD NO GOODNESS TO OFFER GOD WHATSOEVER. ALL YOU HAD WAS YOUR SIN. SO YOU GET BORN AGAIN TOTALLY BY GRACE. WE SING THAT SONG, JUST AS I AM WITHOUT ONE PLEA. IN OTHER WORDS, I DON'T HAVE ANYTHING TO OFFER YOU, GOD. I DON'T HAVE ANY RIGHTEOUSNESS. I JUST, 
O Lamb of God, here I come, and you receive salvation as a gift. And that's the way that you should continue to receive healing and prosperity and joy and peace and your marriage being healed and everything else is just as a gift. But the sad fact is you get born again by grace, but then most people go to church and get taught law and legalism and told that if you don't go to church and if you don't do these things, God won't bless you. Let me give an illustration that, you know, if a drunk was come into your church service, most people who are truly born again and who have experienced any of the grace of God would go to a drunk who came to church and tell them about the love of God and say, God can change your life. God loves you. And they'll say, but I'm drunk. Well, it doesn't matter. God loves you. He can forgive you of your sins. And you would minister mercy towards a person who is lost. But let that person make a profession of his faith, get born again, and come back next Sunday drunk again. And did you know that the average person who would minister mercy and grace towards the lost person would minister law towards a Christian and say, how dare you come here like this? And say, man, now if you don't quit this drinking, God's not going to answer your prayer. God's going to get you. God's going to judge you. See, that's not walking by the same rule. Again, Colossians 2, 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You received grace, you received salvation by grace, but now somehow or another you are maintained in your relationship by law. That's what the average person believes, the average Christian, and that's wrong. That is not accurate. This verse right here is saying that if God loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more now does He love us, that we've been saved by His blood. Not much less, but much more. And then it's summarized in the 10th verse. These two thoughts are put in one verse. It says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Man, that's awesome. But you know, most people are saved by grace, and then they are trying to maintain their relationship with God by performance, by Old Testament law. That was only a temporary measure. That is not how you are supposed to live with God. You're supposed to relate to God by grace. And I'm going to get to this later in more detail, but let me just interject this right here, that this is not saying that this frees us to just go live in sin because sin is an inroad of Satan into our life and we don't want to do that. And so you do need to resist sin and stop sin, but you don't need to relate to God based on your performance. And as you actually access God and receive this grace, the grace of God will teach you to live holy. This is what it says over in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we are supposed to live soberly and righteously in this present age. God's grace teaches you to live holy. Grace doesn't set you free to sin, but it sets you free from sin. A person who says that they understand the grace of God and the way they interpret that is, that just means I can go live in sin. I can do anything. Because after all, God loves me by grace. You haven't received the true grace of God because the grace of God teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. But you do it now out of the motivation of love for what you have, not debt trying to obtain something from God that you don't have. There is a huge difference between those two. Let me jump, jump down here to verse uh, 12. I mentioned this earlier. You know, in a sense, what I've done is I've paint, painted this huge outline of something about who God is. Now I want to just go back and fill in some of the details. So this will fit within some of the things I've already said, but it's going to amplify and give greater clarification on this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And then there's a parenthetical phrase that goes down here through verse 17. But let me just say some things about this verse 12. It says, By one man sin entered into the world. Who was that one man? 
It's talking about Adam. When Adam sinned, his nature was changed. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, "...in the day that you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die." Did you know in the original Hebrew, that's the same Hebrew word repeated twice. It, it literally says, "...in the day you eat of the fruit, you will die, die," is what it says in the Hebrew. Some people interpret that, that dying, you will die. You will start dying, and eventually there will be physical death. But it could also mean that you will surely die, the way that it's translated in the King James, because it's just repeated twice. And so God said, in the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. Now, he didn't die physically until 930 years later, but his spirit was instantly separated from God. When God created man, he breathed into him the breath of life, and God put his spirit inside of man, and that's what gave life to man. In James chapter 2, verse 26, it says, "...as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also." That shows that the spirit is the life-giving part. The spirit gave life to Adam, and it was in communion with God because it was God's spirit. But when he ate of the tree and he rebelled at God, his spirit died. That didn't mean that it ceased to exist. See, this is what a lot of people think when you use the word dead. They say that person's dead, and they just think that they no longer exist. There is no such thing as things just ceasing to exist. Even science will tell you that there is no such thing as total annihilation of anything. When a bomb goes off, all of those particles are still here. Nothing ceases to exist, especially not the spirit inside of a person. It goes to be with the Lord. So when, it's, when we talk about death, it literally is more accurate to talk about separation. Adam's spirit that had been in communion with God now became separated from God. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, we were by nature, that's talking about your spirit being, you were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And the spirit of disobedience worked in us. And so when Adam sinned, his spirit died or was separated from God, and it became united to the devil, and it became a fallen human nature that was dead to God, separated from God. So this is what it's talking about. When Adam sinned, he became separated. He died in his spirit. He was separated from God. And when he had children, he passed on that spirit, the life-giving part of us, but it was a spirit that was separated from God. It was a spirit that was united to the devil, or as Ephesians chapter 2 says, we were by nature the children of wrath. Every person that was born into this earth was born with a fallen human nature. Man, those are strong statements. And again, this is so misunderstood. I, I mentioned this on yesterday's program, but I just read something in the news, and somebody said that people are basically good. That is not what the Word of God teaches. People are basically bad. We have a fallen human nature. Now, when you get born again, God changes that nature, and you become basically good when you're born again. But until you're born again, you aren't basically good. You are by nature a child of wrath, a child of the devil, even as others. Ephesians chapter 2. So this is what this is talking about. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned." Man, there's a lot in that verse. And then in verse 13, it says, "...for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law." That's a strong statement. So in verse 12, he said, "...one man brought sin into the world, and all died through Adam. And so they were, they were sinful and they were separated from God. But then in verse 13, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. The word impute is an accounting term. It's a legal term. And it literally refers to the day when you used to go to a store and you would get supplies and you would say, put that on my account. So they would write down what you've got and they put the price at it. 
beside it. And at the end of the month or whatever period of time, you would have to settle up your bill. And so they would impute it unto you. They would record it, but you hadn't actually paid for it yet. A modern day equivalent of this is the way that we use a credit card. When you give your credit card to some merchant, well, then you haven't actually paid for it. What you've done on that little magnetic strip on the back of that card is all of your personal information, and they impute that sale to you. And they send this information to your credit card company, and then your credit card company sends you a bill at the end of the month, and you have to pay. And if somebody said, but I've already paid for it. No, you didn't pay for it. You just gave them your information and had it imputed unto you. And if you don't agree with that, if you don't believe that, well, then just don't pay your credit card bill when it comes and say, no, I've already paid for it. I gave them my credit card. No, you didn't pay for it. You had it imputed unto you. So this is saying that there was sin in the world before the time that God gave the law through Moses, but sin is not imputed, held to your account, put on the ledger, ledger held against you until the law came. So this is saying that for the first 2,000 years that man, after the sin, before the law was given, for the first 2,000 years, God was not imputing man's sins unto them. Now, that doesn't mean that they were uh, automatically forgiven. They were still sinners and they were separated from God, but God wasn't releasing His wrath. He wasn't demanding payment for those sins until the time that the law was given. Now, that is a radical, radical concept. But again, I'm reading from Scripture. Let me go back and just read this. You know, it's amazing how most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They just believe something, and they don't care what the Bible says. If you, if you have any faith, if you put any priority, importance on the Bible, this should radically change the way that you think about God. Again, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Now, that would lead you to uh, this conclusion. Well, then, if sin wasn't imputed, does that mean that people weren't dying? Because sin produces death. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So does that mean that people didn't die prior to the law? It goes on to say, Nevertheless, death reigned, from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude or in the same manner that Adam transgressed against God, who is the figure of him that was to come. Why is it then, if God wasn't holding men's sins against them, why is it that they died? Because death was the penalty for sin. If he wasn't imputing their sins unto them, how did this happen? It's because there was not only the wrath of God to deal with from sin, but sin was a direct inroad of Satan into your life. I'm out of time. I'm going to have to finish this on my program tomorrow. From the archives of AWM Now comes this story of how your support continues to spread the gospel in practical ways, ways like providing a van that has protected women and children from sex trafficking. When Karis graduates Daniela and Gerd heard that human traffickers had targeted refugees near the border of their home in Poland, they rented a car and drove back and forth to escort as many families as they could to the nearest train station. When their small vehicle could no longer handle the need, Andrew Womack Ministries bought them a van so that even more women and children could escape the sex traffickers preying on them. As of this video, they have delivered over 60 people to safety in Poland. Thank you so much to Andrew Womack Ministries. You was one of the first who supported our uh, work when we went to the border and when we start to have refugees. To see more stories of how your support is spreading the gospel in practical ways, check out our AWM Now series at awmi.net today. I tell you, I'm excited. God is going to do something special during these meetings. We love it because we're here and we're enjoying it. We're seeing it and it's making a difference. I'm telling you, in the spirit, you've got more power than the devil, more power than cancer, more power than poverty, more power than depression. You've got whatever it is that you need. Andrew's teaching and the love that he has for God's Word and truth, it is the gospel truth. Our partners have recently 
enabled us to start producing my television programs in Spanish. I think this is going to be a big help. It's going to reach a number of people. Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world, and I'm excited about this opportunity. If you haven't yet become a partner and been a part of helping us do this, I encourage you to do so. Praise God, we are going to share the gospel in Spanish around the world. Coach Tony and also JB, you know, we started this about two years ago, uh, talking about the kneeling issue in the NFL, and you were sharing with me some of the background stories behind these people, and we just got to saying, we need to get these stories out there because there was another side. I'm Tony Dungy, and I'm really excited about a new series I've been working on with James Brown called Beyond the Game. You've been called Captain Kirk, yeah. you know, a leader of men. Jesus ultimately did that better than anyone, and, uh, and his influence to this day is greater than anyone's. And so I look to him, look to the Bible, look to scripture and, and the gospels to say, how did he lead? What did he do? And then try to live that out. Coaches and athletes in your favorite sports, and you get to see a side of them that we don't always get to see, their face side. We have so much negative press about athletes and, you know, spousal abuse and all kinds of things going on. And I think that this is really going to make a difference for people to see that there's some really godly people out there. Clearly, it's the aberrant behavior of a few that gets the majority of the headlines. So it's not only good for the athletes, but I know that you guys sometimes are just throttled in what you can say about the Lord. We get so frustrated, especially when we'll go out and do a feature piece, uh, but it has to get cut down into a one minute or two minute interview. And the audience can't really hear what is in the heart of these men. We're thankful to you, as Tony said, to give us this platform, Andrew. We'd love to have your help. Go to beyondthegame.co to find out details. Andrew is offering his booklet, The True Nature of God, as his free gift to you today. This offer is limited to one free booklet per household and is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, The True Nature of God, is available in a CD or DVD album and as a book in either English or Spanish. Each of these resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 